Good morning. It is Saturday, February the 19th, and this is The Drill. I'm Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States today, welcoming all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers. Today, after the uh, Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare, the Pledge of Allegiance, and the Star-Spangled Banner, we will have uh, No Free Lunch and the People's House. All that and more when I get back. Thank you, thank you. Ineffable creator, who out of the treasures of thy wisdom has appointed three hierarchies of angels and set them into admirable order high above the heavens and has disposed the diverse portion of the universe in such marvelous array. Thou who art called the true source of light and supereminent principle of wisdom, be pleased to cast a beam of thy radiance upon the darkness of my mind and dispel me from the double darkness of sin and ignorance in which I have been born. Thou who makest eloquent the tongues of little children, fashion my words and pour upon my lips the grace of thy benediction. Grant me penetration to understand, capacity to retain, method and facility in study, subtlety in interpretation, and abundant grace of expression. Order the beginning Direct the progress and perfect the achievement of my work. Thou, who art true God and man, and livest and reignest forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, thank you. And now the... Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare for February the 19th. You are the apple of my eye. I have probed your heart and tested you, and I know that you have no evil plans and your mouth has not transgressed against me. You have kept yourself from the ways of the violent by following my commandments. Your steps have held to my paths, and your feet have not stumbled. When you call to me, I will answer you. I will turn my ear to you and hear your prayer. I will show you the wonders of my great love and will save you by my right hand. Because you are the apple of my eye, I will confront your enemies and bring them down. My mighty sword will rescue you from the wicked. I will vindicate you and you will see my face when you awake and will be satisfied with seeing my likeness and protection. Psalm 17. Prayer Declaration Lord, you found me in a desert land, a howling wilderness, and you encircled me and instructed me and kept me as the apple of your eye. You have promised to shake your hand against those who dare to touch the apple of your eye with trouble. You will cause my enemies to become spoil for your servants, and by this will everyone know that I am your inheritance and you have chosen to dwell in my midst. And that was the Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare for February the 19th.
Thank you, thank you. Who is the true conservative? He is the person that has the courage of his convictions and is confident in what he knows. He is the person that understands that cultural conservatism is more important than political conservatism. He is not selfish, but minds his own business. He acts like an adult. He is patriotic and uses common sense. He expresses what he knows and does so with certainty. He makes judgments, refuses to speculate, speaks clearly and definitively, and is not afraid to say no. He's open-minded asking why rather than why not. He is consistent, credible, and influential, not ashamed of his existence, unafraid to learn or correct his mistakes. He is a normal American, and he's better than the socialist. He's a better friend, father, brother, family member, and a better person, period. You have to know that. If you don't know with every fiber of your being that being a true conservative is best, then you're wasting your time. Thank you, thank you. And now, there's no free lunch. Despite those who equate free market economics with greed, the heyday of laissez-faire economics in the 19th century also saw an unprecedented outpouring of private philanthropy. Moreover, the materialistic Americans are unique in the many academic, medical, and other institutions founded and sustained with private Voluntary Contributions, Thomas Sowell. For the camp who advocates social justice via confiscation, this basic fact that Sowell affirms may not be sufficient. Nevertheless, one undeniable byproduct of the last 150 years of wealth creation via market forces has been a level of private, voluntary, and therefore charitable endeavors, never before seen in human history. Were the charitable impulses new? Of course not. What was new was that the wealth that free enterprise created, which was now available to fund such philanthropic passions. And that was There's No Free Lunch. Thank you, thank you. And now, The People's House. At 2 o'clock in the morning on October 9, 1974, Federal Park Police spotted a sedan weaving boozily across the lanes of Independence Avenue on its way to Capitol Hill from downtown Washington. They pulled the car over. As it drew to a stop, the passenger door was flung open, and a woman hurled herself out of the car, lurched toward the mall, stumbled, and flung herself into the tidal basin to make a swim for it. The police fished her out. The next morning, all Washington knew who she was, an Argentine-born stripper named Fanny Fox. With rather more surprise, it was also learned who the driver of the car was, Representative Wilbur Mills of Arkansas, chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, the tax writing committee of the House of Representatives. As if that were not enough excitement, Mills flew to Boston a couple of months later and held a drunken press conference in the dressing room of Fox's strip club. Mills is not well remembered anymore. More famous Arkansas's Arkansans. Yeah, it should have to be Arkansans, but it doesn't read that way. Anyways, more famous Arkansans have since had more celebrated trouble with women. But in 1974, he ranked as one of the half dozen most powerful economic policymakers in Washington. The foundation of Mills' power was the arcane procedures of the U.S. Congress. 19th century congresses were jumbles of strangers yoked together by party feeling and ruled to the extent that they were ruled at all by high-handed speakers of the House. In the early years of the 20th century, the hubbub and fractiousness of Congress calmed down and regularized regularized itself. Members served longer and longer. The committees became more powerful. A quiet oligarchy of long-serving chairmen came to rule Capitol Hill, and Mills was paramount among those men. He ruled his committee like a tyrant. The committee staff, for example, was hired by and reported to him personally, and his committee ruled the Congress. His committee, meaning Mills himself, wrote American tax law. Mills' tax bills invariably went to the floor under a closed rule, meaning no amendments were permitted. Congress could only vote straight up or straight down. 
Mills controlled the larger Congress too. In those days, the Ways and Means Committee, again meaning Mills himself, also functioned as the Committee on Committees and assigned all committee house memberships. It was Mills who decided whether the eager young freshman from Kansas was assigned to the Agriculture Committee or else to the Committee on the Fisheries. Mills was the strongest of the congressional old bulls, but there were a half dozen other men to be reckoned with. The chairman of the Rules Committee, which determined when and how a bill would get voted on. The chairman of Armed Services, who presided over the defense budget, and so on. These men got their original assignments when they were comparative striplings, and then, if they lived and their party held on to power, ascended into the chairmanship by unshakable rights of seniority. Not even visible and palpable senility could dislodge a chairman so long as his constituents kept returning him to Congress. As might be expected of a legislature ruled by old men, the mid-century House of Representatives was a conservative institution. Between the passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938 and Lyndon Johnson's whirlwind of legislation in 1964, Congress passed only a single major new domestic program, the interstate highways. To liberals, it was maddening. Every other November, the New Deal coalition worked like a charm, electing big Democratic majorities from farm and factory. Then, for the remaining 729 days of the biennium, the committee chairman balked and stymied all the New Dealers' best work. How could this happen? Look at the shape of Congress elected in one of these New Deal coalition elections. 1954, the election in which the Democrats recaptured the House after the Eisenhower sweep of 1952. On paper, the Democrats enjoyed a comfortable majority in the 1955-56 House, 232 to 203, but 92 of those 232 Democrats came from 11 segregated states, Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Virginia. As a result, the real working majority of most of the Congresses from 1938 to 1974 was a coalition of 90 or so Southern Democrats and the 125 most conservative Republicans. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. The congressional system of mid-century gets a bad press nowadays. The racial attitudes of its barons were unappetizing, and they did not always worry quite as hard as they ought about ethics. Congress cared more about paying down the country's World War II and Korean War debts than about creating anything new. Its leadership was dismayingly unrepresentative of the country, all white, all male, mostly southern, mostly elderly, mostly rural. But the old unrepresentative Congress was also capable of surprisingly decisive action. When a president wanted something from the House, there were usually only about three or four men he needed to discuss it with, and they were almost invariably men for whom deference to the president, especially on national security and foreign affairs, was a central doctrine of their creed. It was the old unrepresentative barons who delivered the votes for the Marshall Plan, who agreed to dismantle uh, century-old American tariffs to promote European and Japanese recovery, who stuck by John Kennedy without a whisper of doubt as he brought the world to the brink of nuclear war, first over Berlin and then over Cuba. In other words, the system had its points, so long as Americans were willing to trade representativeness for effectiveness. By the mid-1960s, that willingness was running out. Lyndon Johnson's 1964 landslide, he swept 295 Democrats into the House with him, the most smashing Democratic congressional victory since 1936, freed him from dependency on the Southern Democrats. For two magic years, Johnson led the liberal coalition that FDR had dreamt of. It was this new coalition that passed the mighty Voting Rights Act of 1965, which pressed the plunger on the dynamite charges that would destroy the bourbon democracy of the South. There had been only five black members of the U.S. House of Representatives in 1965, all from the North. There were already ten in 1970, and by 1975, there would be 18. Between 1965 and 73, the number of black elected officials in the 11 southern states jumped by a factor of 10, culminating in the election of Maynard Jackson as mayor of Atlanta, the most important city of the South, on October 16, 1973. 
The northern liberals, white and black, now greased their guns, filled their ammo boxes, and ready themselves to hunt down the last of the great white chairman. The hunting party was led by Philip Burton, a labor-backed congressman from San Francisco and the real leader of the House in the middle and late 70s. Burton's premature death in 1983 crimped his fame. He is now remembered, when he is remembered, as the name over the door of the federal building in downtown San Francisco. It seems a paltry acknowledgment of the man who created the modern Congress. If only he had not been so abrasive, difficult, tyrannical, ruthless, or possibly if that modern Congress were a more attractive and appealing thing, then perhaps the Capitol Dome would have been named after him. Burton set to work to make himself speaker and to break the chairman, and he steadily made converts among the ever more liberal Democrats sent to Congress in 1970, 1972, and 1974. The old bulls sensed the crumbling of their position and vainly tried to placate the reformers. In February 1973, Mills agreed as an experiment to let a tax bill go to the floor unprotected by closed rule, the first time that had occurred since the 1920s. Mills' experiment triggered an explosion in the number of lobbyists employed in Washington. Although statistics on lobbying are hard to come by, one of the few solid ones shows that some 3,000 people were registered as lobbyists of the Senate in 1976, the first year that body kept count. By 1987, that figure had tripled to 9,000. Before 1973, a corporation seeking a tax favor need worry only about convincing a single man or, at most, a few party leaders. After 1973, any one of the 435 members of the House or the 100 members of the Senate could write an amendment containing the favor and have a fair change of negotiating a fair chance of negotiating it into law. Burton seized on the disgrace of Mills as an opportunity to break the power of the old Southern congressional barons, but he really needed no excuse. Within days of the November 1974 election, which sent a huge class of reform-minded liberals to Washington, Burton transferred the power to name committee members from Ways and Means to a new steering committee. The Democratic caucus had already voted to put an end to committee secrecy. All committee meetings would be open unless the committee affirmatively voted to close it. Burton and the 1974 freshmen next pressured the party's old leadership to permit a secret ballot on any chairmanship if half the members of the Democratic Congress uh, caucus would sign their names to a request for a vote. The leaders acceded. They felt the ground shifting under their feet, and the Burton request seemed relatively moderate. After all, the old leaders figured, unless a chairman was glaringly past it, What caucus member would dare risk his retaliation by publicly coming out in opposition to him? Burton, however, had outsmarted them. He immediately rallied the liberals on uh, the Democratic caucus to sign papers calling for secret ballots on all committee chairmen. By calling for a vote on every chairman, Burton enabled his liberal followers to explain to the sputtering old bills that his signature was nothing personal. I wasn't voting against you. I like you. I was voting against the system. And because the actual selection ballot would be secret, Burton freed his followers to promise their support to the existing committee chairman that they would support them on the final vote. Burton showed up at the end of December with his signatures. As soon as the Christmas holidays ended, the aged grandees of the party were hauled before the baying liberals of the caucus and quizzed for hours about their worthiness to retain their posts. Not all took kindly to the interrogation. F. Edward Herbert, the 74-year-old Louisiana chairman of the Armed Services Committee, a member of the House for 34 years, sarcastically addressed his questioners as boys and girls. Herbert was one of the three chairmen and two subcommittee chairmen deposed that January. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. True, the great majority of the old bulls survived the post-revolutionary guillotine. Their power, however, had been stripped. Nothing humbles an autocrat quite like the need to grub for votes. The old chairman used to ascend to their gavels by longevity. They did not have to be nice to anybody. Suddenly, they had to be nice to the Democratic caucus. So, like the skilled politicians they were, they went to work to ascertain what their new constituents wanted, and to deliver it. Did Democratic caucus members want chairmanships of their own, and without waiting 30 or 40 years? No problem. 
Like owners of grand Edwardian homes in an age of shrinking families, the grandees promptly set about chopping up their drafty committees into dozens of subcommittees, dozens of them, each surmounted by a happy new subcommittee chairman. Burton's reforms level power within Congress. Instead of a mighty few surrounded by the obedient many, Congress was now made up of a somewhat mighty many able to compel no obedience at all. Burton had promised that weakening the big shots would heighten the accountability and responsiveness of Congress. No question, Congress had become more responsive, but it simultaneously became dramatically less effective and accountable. Under the old system, only a comparable, a comparative handful of members had any power. If they abused that power, it would be noticed, if not by the press, then by their colleagues, and if noticed, then punished. But now dozens, maybe even hundreds of congressmen, Control the fates of firms, industries, whole nations, hundreds of special interests soon buzzed around those dozens, pressing money into their hands, lobbying, cajoling, persuading. The ambitious new subcommittee chairman, hungry for campaign contributions to stave off the electorate's post-1978 Republican trend, all too eagerly responded to their donors' concerns. But since the most active constituents simultaneously expected them to flay those donors in the name of anti-corporate liberalism, That responsiveness had to be disguised and concealed. The chairman coped with their dilemma by evasion, by voting one way on a procedural vote and then another on the merits of the bill, or voting no on laws they really favored after first establishing that the thing had the support to pass even without their vote. In this deliberately created muddle, nobody, often not even the congressmen themselves, could ever quite discern why things happened, who made things happen, or even frequently what had happened. It was hopeless to imagine that an ordinary citizen could force his way through the buzzing cloud, much less exert any real influence. Very much to the surprise of the reform members, this new, more responsive, less hierarchical Congress had got less done than the old oligarchy had. The day is gone, said the new Ways and Means Chairman Al Ullman of Washington State, when a chairman can wrap up a neat little package in his back room. The open hearings and open markups in which all members, not just a few, have a say is the way this committee must work. The old unreformed Congress had enacted the Supplemental Security Income Program in 1971. The new reformed Congress could never quite organize itself to enact anything on such a large scale ever again. Besides, it did not have the money. The old bulls had maintained a reasonable grip on the finances of the United States, indulging themselves every other year with a big hike in Social Security payments. The reformed Congress let that grip slip. It could not even complete its budgets on time. In a desperate attempt to get back on schedule, it voted in 1974 to shift the end of its fiscal year three months forward from March 30th to June 30th, effective in 1976. The gambit failed. Congress missed the June 30 deadline the very next year, and after that it gave up and relied instead on continuing resolutions. Resolutions telling government agencies to carry on what they were doing until they were told otherwise. These CRs were blank checks to the bureaucracy. In the first six months of 1974, spending jumped by $30 billion. This at a time when $30 billion was still real money. Over the seven fiscal years from 1974 through 1980, non-defense and foreign assistance spending jumped from $174 billion to $444 billion. Not only did the reformed Congress accomplish less than the unreformed Congress it was, despite its endless preoccupations with ethics, quickly perceived as more corrupt. Congress enacted a comprehensive reform of campaign finance in 1974, legislating strict limits on how much political campaigns could spend and political donors could give, 1000 for individuals, 5000 for political action committees. The Supreme Court declared the spending limits unconstitutional in 1976, but the donor limits stayed. Raising the money to fight a modern political campaign in $1,000 increments, however, is, as politicians complain, like filling a bathtub with a tablespoon. In the 1990s, it cost at least a million to run a professional house race in an urban district. That means that even a member of Congress willing to raise all his money from political action committees needs to receive a minimum of 200 contributions in two years. All that schnorring makes even an honest man look crooked. In the 1950s and early 60s, only about a quarter of Americans said yes to the question, I don't think public officials care much what people like me think. 
that sad response rose to about one-third by the mid-1960s to more than 40% in 1968 and to an outright majority of the population in 1976. By the mid-1970s, two-thirds of the public said they felt what they think does not really count. Sociologists would spend years puzzling over those numbers, but one ought not too quickly to reject the hypothesis that people felt that their views did not much count, because in fact, their views did not much count. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. The school's children attend. The curriculum they will study and the way in which those schools are financed, even the language of instruction, have in hundreds of communi- communities been decided not by an elected school board, but by a federal judge. The highways follow not the route preferred by local elected officials, but one that emerged from a negotiation between local environmental groups and the federal environmental bureaucracy, again brokered by a judge. Offices are designed not for beauty or comfort, but to conform to the minute regulations of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Energy Department's fuel efficiency standards. Whether there is sufficient electricity to power town's air conditioners depends on whether the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Energy, state officials, and the federal judiciary could reach a deal on the local utility's latest expansion plan. An executive chances on of promotion depend rather less on his merits than on his employer's needs to ensure that upper management conform to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's assessment of how many blacks, women, Hispanics, Native Americans, disabled persons, and foreign-born are appropriate for a firm in its region and its industry. A similar story could be told in almost every advanced industrial country. In Europe, decision-making power is shifting from elected legislatures to an unelected European commission with vast regulatory power. In Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, parliaments are being displaced by the judiciary and appointed commissioners. The South Bostonians tried and tried again to stop busing at the ballot box. They never came close to succeeding, and they raged bitterly at the representatives who could not or would not help them. We're the poor son of a bees who pay our taxes and sweat tuitions, sweat mortgages and car payments and the cost of groceries and fuel, get no handouts, give our blood, take our turn in line, volunteer for charities, and work two jobs, sometimes three, wrote a columnist in the West Roxbury transcript at the fiercest moment of the busing struggle. But none of it mattered. His people were entitled to nothing. Praise Angela Davis. Hurrah for Ellsberg. Feel sorry for poor Patricia Hurst. But the poor, battered, bruised, white Bostonians, forget them. In 1960, the ward of Boston that encompasses Southie gave 88% of its vote to Kennedy. It forgave Lyndon Johnson for not being Irish and gave him 90% in 1964. But the Democratic vote in this most uh, Democratic of districts slipped in 1968 and then collapsed. In 1980, South Boston voted 53% for Reagan. In 1984... 60%. If it was not busing, then it was something else. In 1964, when Barry Goldwater ran for president, his warnings against overweening government struck most Americans as hyperbolic. Only 30% agreed with uh, Goldwater that government had grown too powerful. He was only slightly ahead of his time. Four years later, in 1968, 40% had come to agree that government was too powerful. And between 1968 and 1980, that 40% plurality became an absolute majority of the American people. The attempt to make government responsive and instead stoked voters' fears and dulled their sense of connection to government. Americans withdrew from civic life in the 1970s, and every presidential election from 1940 through 1968, except 1948, participation approached or exceeded 60%. Off-year turnout between 1950 and 1970 bounced between 40 and 45%. After 1976, voter turnout plunged to a consistent 50% presidential years and barely 33% in off years. This unwillingness to vote corresponded to an even more drastic unwillingness to read about or pay attention to politics. Between 1972 and 1980, the proportion of Americans who had said that they followed public affairs hardly at all or only now and then jumped from 27 to 38%, while the proportion who paid attention to public affairs most of the time, dropped from 36% to 26%. 
There is much hand-wringing over these statistics, but sensitive nostrils could not help sniffing the aroma of hypocrisy. In 1973, the Yankolovich poll found that 60% of Americans now believe the country to be a democracy in name only. This was supposed to be a very bad thing, the ultimate manifestation of the people's lack of confidence in their government. But was it really so surprising? For a decade, power had been massively and systematically transferred from the elective branches of government where it could be controlled to non-elective branches where it could not. Power flowed from prominent and visible officials to a multiplicity of the obscure and invisible. Was it surprising that a country's government had decided to treat its people like subjects should find that those same people no longer felt themselves to be citizens? And that was the um, segment of the book called... um, um uh, uh, called the called the people's house of the book um how we got here the 70s thank you thank you who is the socialist he is the man that seeks consensus he is subjective petty and small taking everything in life personally He's outrageous, boring, and rude. He pretends to be a leader and a change agent. He pretends that he's your friend. He is sly, cunning, and deceptive. He dresses, acts, and speaks like a slob. He's informal and terminally unique. He is childish and pretends that he knows nothing. He has no conscience and pretends that might makes right and that the ends justify the means. He's impulsive and rationalizes his behavior. He's deterministic, blaming others for his mistakes. He's skeptical, demanding that others solve his problems. His unreasonableness and irresponsibility make him a bad role model, bad father, brother, family member, friend, and a bad person, period. So if you think that you can be friends with a socialist, think again. Thank you, thank you. This is Ron, your host, the uh, only true conservative in the United States today, bidding adios to the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there, reminding you to uh, be honest, to be smart, to be beautiful, and to remember that the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.